to communicate to us. So that's the difference. So it's very cool. Uh, so when Joel Olstein was preaching from Josiah, about Josiah, right? Uh, he's talking about special revelation, right? A story that where God worked through people specifically. And then we can learn from that. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, so there are a couple things we're going to deal with today. We're going to uh, hopefully get to it, but um, there's certain. I, I've been trying to preach the importance of philosophy uh, to you as personal um, use of philosophy and professional use of philosophy. What are some of the uses of philosophy? Uh, I have to sell this because you will be told that unless your classes have anything to do with your job, then they're valueless, right? People go, eh, I gotta take this class, but you know, I'm not, it's not my nursing class, or it's not my, you know, in your case, chemistry, right? Um, what can you do with a philosophy degree? Well, what can you do with philosophy? You can live philosophy, right? Uh, I mean, you, 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 when I say you live philosophy, you live philosophically. People bring up issues and you have to think about these issues, right? Before you vote, uh, what you think about it, what they say. Is it true? Is the word I always want you to start using. Is it true, okay? But some of the professions I think that are good for people who take philosophy or even philosophy majors, but let me give you a few. Uh, you get a degree or a minor in philosophy and or you know other degrees. You can go into law. Uh, philosophers make great lawyers. Uh, public policy, you know, people who actually think about how things should be run. Uh, politicians, philosophers, we need more philosophers <laughs> and not Marxist philosophers, that's for certain, uh, in politics, okay? Most, by the way, most lawyers, I mean, most politicians are lawyers. If you have a law degree, you're, I mean, a philosophy degree, and you become a lawyer, you're a much better lawyer, and that will certainly make you a much better politician. Okay? Pastors and priests on every corner of America, there is a church. You know, went to Lakewood. Sir David, right? You, you go to church ever? And if you do, where do you go? Actually, I'm from California, so um, yeah, I used to go to church in uh, Covina. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so you go to church in Covina, and they have churches out there too, don't they? Yeah. So wherever you go, there's going to be a church all over the world. And church pastors are trained. They're trained in two areas, theology and philosophy. Philosophy is the handmaid uh, of handmaid of, philosophy, of theology, okay? You're a much better theologian if you are a philosopher, you'll note that we are talking about Augustine right now. But Augustine was a bishop in the church. He was a theologian. But yet we're talking about Augustine the philosopher in this class because he is a preeminent philosopher. Now, a lot of you are like, oh, okay, whatever, Pastor. I think, you know, uh, one of the things that has gone on in our society is when they teach you about your professions growing up, they never bring, tend to bring up that as a, a legitimate profession. But it is, isn't it? I mean, there's literally a church on every corner. There are more churches than there are McDonald's. And people work at McDonald's and they go, hey, if you're a manager at McDonald's, that's a legitimate profession, right? If you're a manager at Target, that's a legitimate profession. But what if you're the CEO, head pastor, that is, of a church? Solid, right? And you gotta be a great thinker to do that, all right? If you have a philosophy degree, you can go into the military and be an officer. You'd be a great officer at that because you will be a good thinker, a good analyzer, a probably a better leader than others would be. You could be the manager of, uh, of businesses and be, they look for, uh, companies look for people with good critical thinking skills. And what, if, what does philosophy teach you? Critical thinking skills, okay? If nothing else, when you get out of this class, you, do, you should understand that all these people, the famous philosophers that we talk about, see philosophy isn't a study of those people, 
We study those people to do what they did so that we could become like they were, that is, great thinkers. They are the superstars of thinking, critical thinking, right? And of what they thought about. And that's why we learn it. And then there are professions that this will certainly help. What were the ones I named? I named, obviously, the pastor, priesthood, rabbinical, right? Use politicians, lawyers, what? Law, right? Yes. Um, and business. Now, and of course, going into the military. Now, there are others. Uh, you could go into uh, work in the CIA. Now, of course, they like specific degrees. They like accounting and stuff like that. But if you become, say, some kind of, uh, you, you know, not all CIA agents, central intelligence agencies, agent, not all of them are uh, accountants, but, you know, you, you have the prerequisite of having a degree to go in and you can um, do other things like operations and stuff like that, the enforcement type stuff. And you would be a great analyst in that regard because you're smarter than people because you've been trained to think. So let's not let, uh, now trust me, there are tons of jobs that just want educations out there that are not specific, okay? And philosophy helps you as a thinker. Now my suggestion is to get a minor. Now I'm not saying minor in philosophy, you do that or get one in government because you're not only uh, are you a thinker as a human? You are a what? Citizen. And uh, David, you're, you're a citizen, right? right? Of the United States? Yeah. You're a citizen of California or Texas? California. Right, now you're res residing, you're a resident in Texas. Do you like Texas? Mm, it's cool. It's cool. It's not home though, is it? No. Now you wanna go back to Covina? Actually, I'm from Pandora, but yeah. From where? Glendora, okay. Uh, but still, California's nice, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I love the weather in California. I still reminisce uh, talking about, but I want to go back. It'd be hard for me to go back and live there. Politically, I'm just not, I don't fit in too well. Culturally, I kind of do, though. I love the weather. I love the people. I love the movies. I love sports. I mean, I love the mountains and the ocean. So all that I'm cool with, right? And I got a lot of great friends out there, so... So I miss it a lot. Yeah. I like Texas, huh? Uh, could use some more mountains. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I look out there, I go, man, this place is flat. But that's all right, that's all right. Um, a little less humidity. Um, okay. But so, uh, I, I always say get a, get a minor. Um, do you have a major, what's your major? Well, I kind of just found out my major. That's fine. That's what, you know what? That's fine. You know, my suggestion to you is, so once you get this degree, um, once you finish your degree, uh, you can focus on something specific as a master's degree if you want to. Do you have any uh, idea what you want to do when you get out of here? Uh, I don't want to sports broadcasting or advertising. Okay, that's fine, yeah. So uh, think in terms of master's programs that will help you get the very thing, if we're going to learn from Aristotle, is see what your target is and what it takes to hit it, okay? Okay, if we're going to learn from Aristotle, that's one thing we can learn. What is your target and how to hit it, right? You need to know what you need. You need to know what type of thing you're going to shoot with. If they, so go find out what it takes to get those. Uh, and if they say you need a broadcasting degree, change majors, okay? Don't, don't just hope, okay? Think through it. But, uh, but if nothing else, get a double major because it opens up doors that you will never know because sometimes you need a plan B. That makes sense. Okay, I'm a big, big fan of plan Bs. All right. All right, so I, I, I'm a big believer that philosophy uh, is not necessarily a vocation degree. We, we get it to, because it's good for, for what it does for us outside of our vocations just in life. And so if you guys were to get a double major, I think that would be smart. Um, but the fact is that you can use it uh, vocationally and don't let other people tell you otherwise, all right? If you were to decide that. Well, um, 
I wanted to talk a bit about uh, Augustine and Augustine and I want to talk about God and time started giving you a lecture on government there um, at the beginning of the book uh, confessions Augustine says something very deep and rich that the heart is restless until it rests in thee all right and that harkens back to Aristotle when Aristotle says that everything aims at some good and he's right it does and our heart is we aim towards happiness it's like from the day we're born what are you going to be when you grow up why did you choose that you know we all wanted to be something great didn't we i've got my mom sent me little pictures that i drew when i was probably in fourth or fifth grade maybe and they're me you know in a spaceman outfit and way in the background earth i'm so proud of that picture and you know i've <laughs> I'm not much of a flyer. It's amazing that I thought stuff like that as a kid, you know. You know, I didn't fly in a plane until I was 19, and I'm like, I think I'll be done with this. I'm like a strap a rocket to my behind and shoot out in space, right? But, you know, I was like, why would I want to do that? Because there's something great about it, right? There's something awesome about Nobody ever aspires to being what? I've always wanted to be in the garbage collecting industry, you know? I can't imagine, you know, my dad was in the military. He was in the military for many years, but he just thought in terms of getting a job because he came from very, you know, he was orphaned at 13. And so he just thought, man, I need a job to take care of you know, myself at the time. And uh, probably never thought, oh, I'll be a lawyer one day. Maybe he did when he was really young, but man, he never got a chance to see high school. So dreams can get dashed, right? But could one be happy without the great profession? Because very few of us are going to be movie stars. Very few of us are going to be astronauts or stuff like that. Well, Augustine says that he's going to place this enduring question of happiness and purpose in God. That there's a stirring in us that our heart is restless until it rests in thee. And that until we're, we're there in God's grace, God's mercy, and that that relationship with him that there's there's a, a a yearning and a desire for something greater than what we are and think about it think about your life think about really how we aim ourselves and our purpose and what we fill our lives with if only i had this if only i had that if i had this then this would be better and a lot of people place it in relationships right a lot of people be like, or like, if I if only I had a great girl in my life and a wife or something. If only I had a great guy in my life who would love me. That's quite codependent, by the way, to think that your value is only in as much as you are loved by somebody else, right? That gives them a lot more power than you have. You should be loved because you are lovable, right? You are not lovable only because you are loved. that mind but nonetheless once we place our relationships in that you know our our happiness and our self-worth in a human relationship well we're going to be quickly disappointed right because we'll be loved by imperfect people and we'll see all the chinks in their armor once we're in that relationship and the euphoria wears off and thus your heart becomes restless again realize huh resting in this thing human is not gonna give me rest I'm restless still and thus Augustine suggests that our our heart will be restless until it rests in God and God is our ultimate goal that's where our eternity lies so the big picture and he starts talking about before he gets into his, his biography, he starts talking about what God is. Who is God? What is the nature of God? What does it mean to be God? 
What are some of the attributes of God? When you think of God, what are the things you think of? Go ahead, Xavier. Yeah, powerful. Is God as powerful as I am? Yeah. He's a little, he's a little more powerful than that, wouldn't you say? Way more. Okay, thank you, way more. Um, now, there are some interesting things about God's power. What, what, what is the name of God's power? We call it omnipotence. Potency is to do with power. Omnipotence. We talk about potential. Has to do with power. Your potential. The actuality of your potential, you know, is usually less than what your potential is. You usually have more power than you put out. God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. Does God have the ability to do all things? Does he? Are there limitations in God? Okay, so can God be non-God? No. no. So some of God's limitations are not limitations, they're not defects. They are actually, uh, he is limited in the sense that he cannot have a defect. His perfection keeps him from being imperfect. Okay? So God is, would be all-powerful. So God's power does not allow him to have a lack of power. Can God make a rock so big that he can't lift it? No. Because that would, one, be a logical inconsistency because God is so powerful. God could do, you know, lift all physical things if he wanted. Now, by the way, um, there's also a presupposition with God's power that, that God's power has to do with physics. We always measure things in human terms, okay? And that, that's fine because we're humans and so we tend to anthropomorphize things about God. What does it mean to anthropomorphize? Humanize. Yeah, I mean, you talk about things in human terms. We do that with Disney characters all the time, turn animals into humans, right? When in fact, they are animals. Um, God is more than just all-powerful, though. What else would God be? What? Okay, that has to do with his, with his personality, right? So God is personal, okay? So we can talk about um, God's personality traits. If God is personal, then there are personality traits, okay? So I would write down personal. But what does it mean to be personal? We can talk about another uh, attribute of God, and that would be God's intellect. Okay? God has an intellect. That is, God has knowledge, and God is omniscient. God is omniscient. Now, omni obviously has to do with all, right? If omni... Um, omnipotence has to do with all-powerful and omniscient would have to do what was the uh, Greek word for knowledge Epis epistemology. that's right epistemology because we're still in philosophy right and what was the Latin word for sign uh, for knowledge I just almost said it what scientia which we get science from omniscience what does that sound like like omni science right Okay, well, it has to do with all knowing. God knows all things. God knows all things. God knows what you're going to do. God doesn't know all things that you're going to do because he chose you to do them, but, you know, you, he knows that you did. Well, he knows what you're going to do before you do it. He knows why you're going to do things, even if you're unaware of it. There's some of our character traits. We do all sorts of weird things. We don't even know why we do them. Right? And if we reflect upon them, you go, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I did this for that reason. Yeah, that makes sense. Go to a good counselor. They'll help you. God knows your heart. God knows what's inside you. 
He knows your pain. He knows your hurt. He knows science. God knows physics and math and all that, right? He knows it. He knows the boring and the, and the, the exciting. He knows all future contingencies, all if-then statements. If A is, you know, if you do this, what will happen? What's a butterfly effect? Has anybody ever heard of that? Have you ever seen the movie? I think it had, I forget the guy's name. You've seen it? Creepy, huh? Where he keeps going and back in time, or is it forward in time? Some, he does something different, but every time he does something, it changes radically the, the, the future, doesn't it? And all he's trying to do is go, let me get a future that is acceptable because he has ruined the lives, hasn't he? I, I forget, uh, what was the guy's name? It's an old movie, but it was it's kind of a unsettling movie to me. I didn't like it. I mean, I liked it. It was good. It was well done, but I didn't like it. But this idea of if you do something here, what happens way down the line? All right? What you thinking about, Xavier? That, that's the future you guys are talking about? No, it, it, the movie's called The Butterfly Effect, oh. but it's named after the side, a theory called Butterfly Effect. That, like, if a butterfly dies out in the you know, well, it still has an effect way down the line on society and, and reality. Uh, but yes, even going back to Back to the Future, you know, he tells Doc, don't, Doc says, don't tell me, you know? And he does. And he writes the letter and Doc won't open it, but then Doc does and changes the future, essentially. But the butterfly effect is like, I mean, it, it had profound effects, not just one little thing, okay? Uh, just, I, you know, if you guys get that movie and watch it, you, you, I think you'd all find it very, very interesting. Well, you found it interesting, right? Yeah, it's, I, it's good. It's like an early 2000s movie. So it's old-er-ish. Okay, but it's good. It's just in, it's a guy from um, that 70s show, right? Dated uh, Demi Moore. I'm not sure. Like, I just see his face, but I don't know. Yeah, I know. Me too. And it's like, it's a handsome kid, right? I think that was how we got the movie here in front of me. All right. So, so God knows all things. God is eternal. Now, what does that mean? God's eternality. Did God exist before we existed? Yeah. Okay. I hope so. See, a lot of people assume that God didn't exist until we exist. That would make us the creator because we, they say God exists because we believe in him. Well, then we're the creator of God. Right? I've heard people say that. Uh, but if that's true, then we're God and not he. Okay. Eternality is not everlasting. Eternality is not everlasting. You have to understand that. What do I mean by everlasting? That God exists in time and that he's just really old. And that you go back millions of years and God existed because God's really old. No. God exists outside of time. You have to understand that time itself came into existence. Time is a creation. Ask yourself, what is time? Can you tell me what time is? Not what time it is. Some of you would say it's 9.30. 29. But no, that's not what I mean. I want to know what the word time means. Now you understand time, right? Because we experience time. The past no longer exists. The future has yet to come. And the present is what? Certainly ever fleeting. No, you're smiling. What's time, buddy? Um, 
the yeah this thing like so like in math there's like equations and like the denominator is usually like change in time so I was gonna say one distance from one thing to the next one. Yeah, okay, keep going. So it's a, you, you divide things up? Yeah. But what are we dividing? Is there a beginning to time? What if there is no beginning to time? Is it like perfect time and future? Well, those are tenses. What about the past? Those are the tenses. You know, we have the past, it doesn't exist. The, the future doesn't exist yet. And the present now, it's gone. Oh, wait, it's gone. Oh, here, here. How long is an instant? How quick? How long does it last? Wait a minute. If it, it, huh? No, there's no, none. It's, it's, it's almost like it doesn't exist at all, does it? You experience, you have these experiences of the now and then it's gone. And the now is constant, but it's, there's change. Is time a measurement of change from A to B, this to that? But what if nothing changes? What if nothing exists and there's no change? Does time exist then? Does it? Is time like the only thing that exists? No, I, I mean, I'm making the claim that time started to exist. God is outside of time. That God created time. When did time come into existence? If God created now, time is considered in physics to be the fourth dimension, okay? At least in my understanding. And so, you know, when... We don't perceive time visually, obviously. We, when we think of, you know, three dimensions, like there's two dimensions, height to width, right? And then a fourth dimension, I couldn't do this, but I could put on here, kind of illustrate a third dimension, right? Um, let's make, you know, let's just kind of shade that as though that were angled, you know? Wait. You know, like you got third dimensions, right? Height, width. But time is this thing that is something not we something we physically through the senses perceive, but it exists. Okay? That until the universe came into existence, time didn't exist. So this idea that the universe is 17 billion years old, you go, okay, the 17 the universe is 17 billion years old. What existed before that? Nothing. And they go, well, you wait long enough, something can happen. Well, wait a minute, there was no time. You had no time. It's not like you wait long enough and you'll get an explosion out of nothing. Time didn't exist. Time is part of the creation. That may be hard to understand. Of course it's hard to understand, right? But who can tell me specific? It's like saying um, yellow. If you don't experience yellow, you can't tell people what yellow is, right? You have to experience yellow to know it. We experience time. We are familiar with what time is. We can talk about time. We give it a name and you go, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about, right? But you can't sit there and say, that's time right there. You say there's a clock somewhere, not here like Vegas you know they don't like the clocks on the wall in Vegas you know they like to keep you there so, all right go ahead Jake so it's considered to be like kind of like an empirical view kind of or well I mean empirical has to do with the five senses right now I can measure a clock right now there are physicists who believe you know time time can be slowed down sped up and all the like okay uh, so that's kind of crazy, right? Um, <laughs> that tells you that the time is literally something, uh, but I don't know. But it's part of the universe, okay? So God is not part of the universe. God is outside of the universe. 
God is eternal. And write this down. God has what's called aseity. A-S-E-I-T-Y. God has aseity. That is self-existence. Self-existence. What now? Think about this, folks. The universe exists and we are part of it. Something exists. We have been caused. We can go to our parents and thank or blame them. Okay? And we can say, well, I had a cause, they had a cause. And, you know, some people will talk about how the human race was caused accidentally through evolution or not. Okay? Some people believe... God used evolution to create human beings. That's all fine and well. Some people believe God specifically created us as we are, and we've uh, come along from uh, an original group of people, particularly to Adam and Eve. The word Adam in Hebrew just means man or mankind. Eve, life giver, Shiva. Okay? Now, that's all fine and well. Okay? But the universe, you have to ask the question, is the universe eternal? Does it exist on its own or not? If it does not, it needs to have a cause. If it is an effect, it has to have a cause. People say, well, does God have a cause? Or what is God's cause? The point here is that something has to exist that is uncaused. Does that make sense? It is not that everything has to have a cause, because clearly that is not the case. Because, let's go back to time. Let's pres presume that there's an infinite amount of time. And you could go backwards an infinite amount of years. Would we ever get to today if there was an infinite amount of years past? The answer is no. How would you get to today? You would have to cross an infinite amount of years to get to today. How about would it get to 100 million years ago? No, because it'd have to pass an infinite amount of years to get to 100 million years ago. How about 100 billion years ago? No, because an infinite is an infinite. Not to mention there's no such thing as infinite, infinity. For example, what is infinity minus one? Infinite, infinity is not an actual number. It is a possibility. You just go, we could possibly keep going. Conceptually, we could continue to go, but that will always be an actual number where infinity is not a real number. The universe had a cause. The universe came into existence. Therefore, it did not always exist. It does not have self-existence, aseity. Whatever has self-existence has that attribute of God called aseity. There is something that has to have self-existence for us to exist at all. Does that make sense, Noah? Oh, yes. Yeah. God is that being which has self-existence. So God is eternal. God is outside of time. He has self-existence. He is not everlasting. That is, he does not exist in time year after year. And he just endures as super old, okay? God is not located in time. Time was created with the world. Augustine said, I know well enough what it is, time being, provided that nobody asks me. But if I am asked what it is and try to explain, I am baffled. And I suspect you feel the same. You know what time it is, or not what time it is, but what time is, but you are baffled to try to explain it. He gives the three divisions of time, which is the past, which is no more, the present, which is ever fleeting, and three, the future which is not yet ask the question what is the unit of time a century a year a decade a month a week a day an hour a minute a second an instant well what is it what is an instant can it be divided the answer is yes
For Augustine, uh, accurately speaking, the past is to speak of the presence of memories of things past. The presence is of our direct awareness, and the future is the presence of expectations. These are all in the mind, he would say. So we've talked about some um, concepts of God, attributes of God. We had eternality, omnipotence, omnipresence. He is personal, right? God is good. That's what we need to know, that God is good. God is good by nature. God is not good in his actions. His actions are good because God is good, and God cannot be bad. That is, if God is the greatest conceivable being, the greatest conceivable being is the most moral being. Okay? God cannot be bad. Can God be evil? No. No more than a triangle cannot be a shape. That is, a triangle cannot violate its nature. A triangle is what it, it is and does what it is. God does that which flows naturally from him, from his nature. God will not violate his nature. God will not be non-God. God will not be the devil. It would be a violation of God's nature to do so. It's like a violation of me saying I'm a human, a non-human. No, I am a human. I cannot be contrary to my nature. So God is good. God is self-existent. God is all-knowing. God is personal and in his personalness. Because he is good, he is moral. And in his morality, yes, you've seen that he is he's forgiving. Man is, is not God. Man is sinful. Man falls short of the glory of God, right? All men have sinned. Is there one sinless? No, not one. Now, Jesus, the incarnation, you know, led a sinless life. And then what we talk about the sacrifice God, God provided. In fact, that's kind of what happened last week, right? That we have this perfect God and we have imperfect man. And we have imperfect man, that God, man is not just uh, imperfect in the sense that uh, we can't abide by God's will perfectly, but that we won't. That there's something about our will that is tainted, that we will, through concupiscence and stain of sin, that we will rebel against God, right? In the Old Testament, God set up a sacrificial system where you would sacrifice a lamb for the forgiveness of sins. But year after year, that had to occur, right? And it was imperfect read the book of Hebrews all right so what does God do well God is the unblemished land God is sinless and so it goes back to what's called the Lexus talionis an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth right if you um, justice remember we talked a little bit about justice justice uh, goes something like this equal pay for equal work you're all for that right no, you, you want unequal work, pay for unequal work? No, you equal pay for equal work. It makes sense, right? That's called distributive justice. Retributive justice is the Lexus talionis, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So if somebody um, you know, scratches your car, you put them to death, right? Right? No, because that is too much for too little. You want the punishment fit in the crime, right? somebody kills somebody what is the penalty often it's the death penalty correct especially if it was not accidental it was on purpose a murder so you, you put there's a lot of people get put to death for murder because they believe the punishment fits a crime okay first degree murder now anything less is a show of mercy would you agree or bad judging. Okay, that could be that. <laughs> uh, anything more, like you put to death people who were not guilty, that's bad too, right? All right, so if you sin against a man, killing him, the payment is what? Death of a man. Not of a lamb, but of a man. Not of your, not of your neighbor's dog or whoever did the, the crime, right? That'd be too little. 
So what have you sinned against to God? Can man pay the price for God? No. Equals being treated equally. And thus, you have the incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? And Jesus, who is fully man, can represent man, but who is fully God, can pay the price against whom was sin. Equals being treated equally, right? And thus Jesus dies on the cross as a sacrifice. What did John the Baptist say when Jesus appeared? To be what? Baptized. But he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Right? Go to Catholic Church. They'll say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay? This idea that Jesus will be offered up as the lamb, that sacrificial lamb for the sins of mankind. Paul says that if you believe in your heart and confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. All right? Well, this is what, this is what Augustine believed, obviously. It's very philosophical. See the Lexus Talionis. It's very theological. It has to do with the mercy, the grace, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, who God is, his nature. Do you need any me to repeat any of that? Yeah, Augustine is a, obviously a Christian at this point as he's writing, so he believes these things and he's he's going to expound. He's a bishop and he's you know clearly teaching these things that God has revealed Himself through man through the incarnation uh, that. Uh, through Christ a sacrifice was made so that men may be forgiven of their sins these are all based on the writings of Paul the apostles and the apostolic teachings obviously so um, let me keep going here Augustine talks about the human nature. That's, that's why we are sinful. That uh, we are two substances. We are body and soul. He's very platonic. Plato believed in the body and the soul. That they are distinct uh, things. We'll talk about what type of distinctions they all are. But the soul is a rational thing that rules the body. Okay? Unfortunately, we often, as sinful men, let our body rule the rational faculties of ourselves. Uh, it's created by God, thus it is good. This goes in contrast to what the Gnostics would have believed. They believed that the body was bad. God created us, body and soul. If God, the good God, a good God does not create bad things. Okay. The Gnostics believed that the body was bad. Scripture, by the way, was created to combat Gnosticism. Gnosticism has to do with knowledge. They believe that there was this hidden knowledge, and again, that there was this fight between uh, good and evil, and, and that the body, the flesh, was bad, and all that. Okay? We are created by God. Who is a just God, yet we act unjustly. We were created for happiness, yet we are miserable because of sin. Augustine taught about original sin, the idea that concupiscence, the stain of sin, entered with Adam and Eve. That sin is present even in infants, babies. He says you just need to watch them. And they'll, they exhibit things like jealousy in all of their innocence, right? I pick up my beautiful, cute little daughter. It's the cutest, sweetest little thing. And then I pick up her little brother, no, her big brother. And, and all of a sudden she starts screaming mad because why? She's jealous, right? So it's not taught. It is there. This stain is passed on to us. It's a condition of the heart and our desires. Sin is misdirected love. Our misdirected loves, I should put plural there. We're almost done, so I apologize if we go over a minute. Because that's important. 
Higher valued things should be valued where they are. They should not be valued higher than lower things. Humans are more important than kittens. I start throwing kittens against the wall, you'll think I'm horrible. You start, you see me start throwing babies against the wall, oh my God, right? I throw rocks against the wall, you're worried about the wall. I throw kittens, you're worried about the kittens and the wall. I start throwing babies, you're not worried about the wall. You're, you, if you are worried about the wall, you're called a sociopath or a psychopath, okay? <laughs> of course, if I'm throwing babies against the wall, I think I'm a psychopath, right? God is the highest ordered good. In Judaism, they would recite the Shema. The word Shema in Hebrew means listen or hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Right? Jesus asked what the greatest commandment was, and that is what was told to him, because that's what the Jews believe. Because the highest order of good is what? God. The highest order of being. And thus, if we value humans over God, our friendship is misdirected. If we believe our country over God's law. Our loves are misdirected. We need to love God first before all else. Follow God before politics. My politics should be directed by God. My worship should not be directed by my politics. Do you understand? I'll close with that.